you know, an important aspect of, of science is being able to, to be rigorous. And I think, you know, that, that is one way in which this imaging system really excels. So if we can really quantitate our proteins and really normalize, you know, to the total protein in that lane instead of actin uh, and tubulin, that's, that's really a time savings and really helps us to, uh, to really analyze our data, I think, in a more efficient and more uh, sophisticated manner. What is the process that actually drives cancer? Like, what is it? So we know that cancer is caused by mutations in several different genes. Um, but what we really don't know is what drives that process. So we like to think of our DNA as being static, so it's sort of safe within the nucleus of a cell, nothing's happening to it. But it's actually changing all the time, and it's because of this constant DNA damage, and as the cell divides, it has to deal with it. One of the main questions we're focused on is what role does DNA repair play in driving the tumorigenic process? So that, that's where the BRCA2 gene comes in. So BRCA2 stands for Breast Cancer Susceptibility Gene 2, and it's involved in a very specialized uh, DNA repair process called homologous recombination. So we had some ideas of how the BRCA2 protein worked. We knew that it bound RAD51, and that's how it was implicated in uh, homologous recombination. So RAD51 is one of the central players in homologous recombination. It's a really interesting protein. So it actually, it forms a filament. So it actually wraps around single-strand DNA and actually extends and stretches that DNA. And that um, RAD51 nuclear protein filament, as we call it, then can invade um, a duplex donor DNA. And at that point, it actually searches for homology. And then that initiates the process of homologous recombination. But we knew that the RAD51 paralogs were related to RAD51, so they look similar. Um, they have similar amino acids, uh, similar sequence homology, uh, but they're different. And we know they're involved in uh, double strand break repair. We know that they're involved in somehow facilitating this RAD51 nucleoprotein filament formation. But we really had no clue, no idea what these proteins are actually doing. And, and really the only way to get at that answer, I think, is to purify all these proteins and then put them together in the test tube and, and do some of these in vitro assays and, and ask different questions like, is there a specific order that we need to put these proteins in these, in these assays to see exactly what is the mechanism of action? So one of the things that we really like about the ChemiDocMP system and using the stain-free gels in conjunction with it is the ability to normalize our Western blots to the total protein in every lane that we load. And the way that most people uh, normalize their um, Western blots is by these loading controls, uh, tubulin, actin, GAP-DH, these are probably the most common. Now the downside of doing that, and you see this over and over in the literature, and everyone does this, is they usually blow out the signal from the actin and the tubulin so that it's not in the linear range of detection of the instrument. And so what you usually see are these huge fat bands of actin and tubulin all along the bottom of the uh, Western blot image. And so if you're trying to compare your protein of interest, you know, in your gel, in your Western blot, and you're trying to normalize to this blown out, you know, saturated signal of actin or tubulin, you're never going to get a quantitative result. So that's where I think I, I really liked where the stain-free gel comes in, because then you can then box those lanes, which is nice because it gives you a representation of all the proteins, you know, in that lane. So it's a much more dynamic range. You know, rather than just looking at actin or tubulin, with the stain-free imaging of the blot, and we're basically boxing those lanes, we're looking at all those proteins at once. I think that's scientifically actually a better way to go about it, a better way to sort of normalize your protein of interest. If, you're, if, you're, if you really want to be precise, you, know, you really want to normalize to something that's going to be representative of what's going on with all these other proteins in the cell. So in our research, you know, we're in a very competitive field, so we need the data as fast as we can, and we have a lot of these cancer patients, and they want us to develop drugs as quickly as possible. And so if we have that data in hand, and we can analyze it as quickly as possible, 
you know, this is one way in which an imaging system or any system can facilitate that process. If we can get that data, if we can see that new protein that interacts with BRCA2, if that's a potential new therapeutic target, that's really what we really want. And we want to identify that protein as quickly as possible and we want to make sure we're doing it right and we're doing it rigorously and we're doing it quantitatively.